Hello health champions. Cancer can be a really scary thing because it seems so totally out of control. But what if you have more control over cancer than you've been led to believe? Today I want to go over 10 signs of cancer, but more importantly I want to help you understand what cancer is, how it develops, and the mechanisms so that you can reduce the risk of ever getting it. Symptom number one could be fatigue. Now fatigue, we shouldn't jump to conclusion because there's a million different things that can cause fatigue, but cancer is one of them, especially if it's not helped by sleep or rest. If it's not going away and if you still have it like over a period of six months, then that could definitely be a problem. And a couple of reasons would be that the cancer growing the cancer is using up some resources in your body and on the other hand your body's immune system is busy fighting this cancer and defeating it so it's like there's this war going on that's using up resources but remember don't jump to conclusions because most commonly fatigue is caused by things like stress and poor nutrition another thing that could be a sign is pain it's things like headaches and back pain and especially if it's chronic, if it goes on for a long, long time, and if it's not changing with body position. So if you have a back pain, for example, very often you can find at least some position where you sit or lay down or you lean or you do something where you reduce or relieve the pain. But if it's what's called a space occupying lesion, where it's a growth that's putting pressure on something, you may not be able to find any position that gives relief and that would be a bad thing. Now let's try to understand a little bit about what cancer is and how these cells are different from normal cells. A normal cell can turn on and it can turn off. A cancer cell is a cell that used to be a normal cell. It's still your cell, but something changed. So it lost the ability to turn off. So this difference, a normal cell is called a regulated cell. The, the growth is regulated. It can grow and develop to a point and then stop. But a cancer cell has lost that ability. It's called unregulated growth. And this difference is one of the main things that is characteristic of a cancer cell. An example would be if you cut your finger, for example. These are different layers of skin cells. So if you cut it, your body's gonna start going to work making new cells. And it's gonna create these precise layers with different functions. And all of these different layers have different types of cells. The cells are called differentiated because they have different purposes. They all start with the same type of cell called a stem cell, but then as they develop, as they mature, they differentiate and they serve their specific purpose. But a cancer cell doesn't do that. It is undifferentiated. So if we have a bunch of different cancer cells next to each other, they don't really look any different. They're just making more copies of the same thing. Another way of saying that is that normal cells will obey the intelligence and the order in the body, whereas cancer cells disobey. They have stopped listening. And the way a cancer cell gets that way is because there are some mutations. A cancer cell is a mutated cell and something has altered that cell. And we're gonna come back and talk about what those different factors are. Symptom number three would be lumps. And this is one many people are aware of. Women are encouraged to self-examine their breasts on a regular basis. And if you find a breast lump, it could indicate a growth that could be cancer. But most of the time, it is a benign growth. It's a fibrous growth, often called a fibroadenoma, or assist. And it's not just women who can get breast cancer, it is increasing in men as well. It's not as common as in women, but it's quite common in men as well. And men can also get lumps and growths on their testicles. So that's another sign of testicular cancer is if you find a little irregular growth on your testicle. Number four, blood in the urine is never a good thing. It could indicate bladder cancer, kidney cancer, or prostate cancer for men. 
but more often it's not that serious. It could be a kidney stone, it could be a urinary tract infection, that's probably the most common one, but it could also be from trauma or infection or toxicity that inflames the tissue. So any kind of inflammation is called an itis. So if you have bladder inflammation, it's called cystitis, kidney inflammation is called glomerulonephritis, or prostate is called prostatitis. Next question is, how does cancer develop? Well, it all starts with a mutation, and the mutation is a change in DNA, change in DNA sequence. And your body makes about one million DNA changes per cell per day. That's just part of daily operations. When we start counting cell replication, making new cells, that number becomes astronomical. You're making 400 billion new cells per day because old ones wear out, so you have to make new ones. And every time you make a new cell, you have to copy 6 billion base pairs, 6 billion pieces of information, and you have to do that correctly. So obviously with that number of copies, it's not going to be perfect. You're making about 120,000 mistakes per cell or per day on the whole, you're making 48,000 trillion mistakes or copy errors. But the body has some ways to deal with that. And if you make a mistake, the body can repair the DNA. So that's the first course of action. And it's a good thing if that's not totally perfect, because if it was absolutely perfect, there would be no genetic variation. We couldn't change our DNA and adapt to things as well. But there shouldn't be too many mistakes either, but a few of them will slip through. And if that DNA repair fails, the next course of action is called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Most of these mistakes are not going to be working solutions. They're not going to function well enough to live, so they just die. But if that apoptosis fails and they survive, now we have a mutation. But the body has even more resources because we have an immune system. We have T cells, we have macrophages, we have phagocytes that can go and find and destroy abnormal cells, things that don't look like they're supposed to, we have a way of finding and eliminating them. And then if that also fails, now we could end up with something called precancer. Because just because it's a mutation doesn't automatically mean that we have cancer. There's still many steps left. So in order to develop cancer, we need two things. We need an initiator. And that is something that it's a stressor that increases the rate of mutation and the severity of the mutation. And those can be things like smoke in cigarette smoke. There are chemicals there. There could be chemicals in the environment. It could be ionizing radiation from excessive x-rays or working around radioactive materials. Or it can even be hormone imbalances that can promote more mutations and more severe mutations. But not even that is enough to develop cancer because we also need a promoter. That's number two. We need one is initiator, two is a promoter, something to drive the process forward. And if we have all of those present, so a promoter would be something that feeds the cancer because the cancer needs a lot of food, but it could also be something that interferes with the body's immune system and the body's defenses. And if all of this is in place for quite some time, now we can develop cancer. But even then, it's not a done deal because it usually takes a long time, even after that, to where we actually have cancer or where it's dangerous. And how long that takes, we're gonna come back and talk about a little bit later. Sign and symptom number five is weight loss. As many as 40% of people who are first diagnosed with cancer have experienced some recent weight loss. And it's not that it's dangerous to lose weight. This weight loss is due to a disease process. This weight loss is usually rapid and unexplained. It's not that someone is trying to lose weight. And it's often but not always associated with a loss of healthy appetite. The body just doesn't have the balance and the resources to process food it is too far gone, and then you don't have much of an appetite anymore. In later stages of cancer, there's also something called cachexia, 
which is wasting. And this goes far beyond just weight loss. This is where your body is completely wasting away, basically. And this happens in as many as 80% of late stage cancers. Remember when I said that there are some cancer promoters, there are some things that have to be present to drive that process forward. So what are those? Well, we can get a clue by the way that they find these cancers or some cancers. It's called PET imaging, positron emission tomography. So the way that they can visualize these cancers, and right there is one, is with radioactive sugar. They inject radioactive sugar into a person, the, the sugar gets into circulation, and it's mostly absorbed by tumors and cancer because these are like sponges for, for sugar. They live off sugar and they can absorb as much as 20 times more sugar than your average cell. That's 2000%. And then when all that radioactive sugar is in the tumor, now we get a focal spot on that imaging. And why do tumors use so much sugar? Because they depend much more heavily than your average cell on glycolysis, on sugar metabolism. They don't burn fat very well. They don't use oxygen very well. They depend much more heavily on the anaerobic process of glycolysis, of splitting sugar. And I don't know about you, but I think this gives us a clue on what we should and shouldn't eat. And maybe they shouldn't give these people toast and orange juice right after their imaging session. Maybe sugar isn't such a good thing. Other promoters are things like chemicals because they interfere with the body's defenses and cleanup process. We have pathogens like virus, bacteria, fungus, etc. Now these can complicate things and they usually don't necessarily cause the problem but they can aggravate the problem and they take advantage of a weakened immune system. So if your immune system is already weakened by sugar and chemicals and toxins, then the pathogens are just gonna make it worse. And of course, stress is a huge factor in promoting cancer because when you're stressed, your body is putting its attention on putting out fires outside of you instead of trying to heal the inside of you. Number six is a fever that would usually be a low-grade fever in the absence of you having a cold or a flu. And it's something that won't go away. It persists for, for weeks. It may not be there all the time. It could come and go during different times of the day, but it's very persistent. And usually, if you get fever in the early stages of the disease process, it means it's a blood-borne cancer like lymphoma or leukemia. But if it comes in the later stages, more advanced stages of cancer, then it would be something other than a bloodborne. And very often we get the impression that cancers just sort of attack people and then it's over in a very short time. But the question is, that's very poorly understood, is when did this start? And we don't have exact answers, but we have a pretty good idea today that it takes a long time. So let's take pancreatic cancer. It is one of the most ferocious types of cancer. Once you get it diagnosed in the late stage, it's over pretty quick. But when did it start? If you had your first mutation, like one cell mutating, getting not a cancer necessarily, but just a mutation, and then we're unfortunate that this mutation continues to progress, then it would take about 12 years before we had a cancer. And there would be multiple progressive mutations and it would take another seven years or so before it was an advanced stage cancer ready for metastasis. And then is when we get the diagnosis and we hear that we only have a short time left. But even though it is one of the most deadly forms, there's a lot of time in between where the body could do something about it. So while there's a huge variability between types of cancer and individuals, on average, we're probably talking 10 to 40 years for a cancer to become a real problem.
Number seven is skin changes. And here's another one that a lot of people are aware of, that if you have moles that start changing, you got to watch out. So there's an ABC for this. A means asymmetry side to side. So if you look at it and one side is kind of round and regular and the other starts looking different, then that's a bad sign. B is border irregular. So anywhere around it where it's not smooth, it starts changing and becoming irregular, that's not a good thing. C means uneven color. So if you look throughout the mole and it's uniform, that's a good thing. But if it's kind of spotty and different colors, not so good. D is diameter. That's the size of it. So if you look at it and it's larger than the diameter of a pencil or a pencil eraser, then that's something to watch out for. And E would be evolving. It means it's changing. You kind of had it for 20 years, but in the last year it looks different. That's something that you want to get checked out. Number eight is changes in bowel habits. So if you have diarrhea, constipation, if there's blood in the stool, if your stool is black and or tarry, if you get abdominal pains or bloating, these could indicate a cancer or colon cancer. Now, if you, have, if you see the blood in the toilet, that means that the lesion, the, the problem, is very close to the exit, close to the rectum. Whereas if you get a black and tarry, that means that the problem is further up the digestive tract so that the blood had time to coagulate before it came out. But as you probably know, you shouldn't jump to conclusions because these are extremely common. So don't just look in this and say, oh my God, I have this. Most of the time it's going to be due to things like food intolerances, small intestine bacterial overgrowth or other imbalances in your biome, in your bacterial flora. Could be a leaky gut with gut inflammation or ulcers can also cause blood in the stool or black and tarry stool. Number nine is dysphagia, and that simply means trouble swallowing. So if you have trouble with that, it could indicate that you have an esophageal cancer, thyroid, vocal cord, or a throat cancer, because any of those could grow a lump of some sort that makes it more difficult to swallow. However, it's much more common that it is something not so serious like gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, which is irritation of the esophagus by acid. And it can also be something called a goiter, which is an enlargement of the thyroid gland. It's a benign enlargement. It's in people who are severely deficient in iodine and the body just compensates by growing the thyroid into a lump that could interfere with swallowing. If you're with me so far, you probably agree that cancer can be a terrible thing and it can move really fast in the advanced stages. But hopefully you also agree that we have a lot of time to prevent things. And we have many, many, many years to prevent the early cancers from becoming full-fledged serious cancers. Because the body has defenses and there are lots of different factors that affect your immune system and your overall health. The body has a structural and emotional and a chemical aspect to it. And all of these affect the homeostasis and your immune status. So the first thing you want to do is to stop feeding the cancer. Don't give it sugar, reduce carbs, reduce sugar, because that is going to reduce the amount of fuel for the cancer to grow. Also, you want to reduce the amount of chemicals because chemicals interfere with the body's cleansing process, with the immunity, with the liver function and so forth. You want to do your best to improve immunity. And of course, all of these build on each other. So sugar will destroy immunity. So by cutting out the sugar, you've already improved your immunity. But you want to understand that immunity is part of all of these three sides, the structural, emotional, and chemical. You want to try to reduce stress because stress is a state where your body is focused on the outside and immunity is where the body is focused inside. 
and when you have a lot of stress that will reduce your DNA repair. So by reducing stress you will improve your DNA repair. Also if you do a breathing exercise and or meditation then you will improve your parasympathetic function. You reduce the stress but you also increase your peripheral vasodilation. So you improve the oxygenation of your tissues and cancer hates oxygen. It loves sugar and hates oxygen. So anything you can do to improve oxygenation is also going to be a good thing. Fasting is another good thing to do. You could do intermittent fasting and then occasionally add in some, some longer fasts because when you fast, of course, you reduce your blood sugar, you improve your immunity, you increase your autophagy, which is part of your immune system, of your recycling. And then to complete the picture, of course, you also want to do some exercise because exercise drives all physiological processes in the body, but also exercise has been shown to improve DNA repair and it has, of course, the ability to improve oxygenation because you increase circulation and you distribute more oxygen to the tissues. And if you watch some of my videos before, you're going to notice that a lot of my recommendations seem to be pretty much the same. And that's exactly right because the solutions are so basic and so simple. What we have to do is we have to grow and enhance our understanding of why those things matter. Because it all boils down to one simple thing, that we all know we're supposed to do these, but if you don't do them, or if you don't do them to the extent that you feel would be good for you, it's because you don't understand them yet. Number 10 is a chronic cough. And mostly caused by smoking, could lead to lung cancer. But just like other cancers, it doesn't happen overnight. Smokers will have years and years of chronic cough called chronic bronchitis as the inside membranes and the cilia of their uh, windpipes start degenerating from that irritation from the smoke and go through these stages of progressive mutations. So we do have a lot of warning signals in some cases and the smart thing would be to start listening to those warning signals. Most coughing though, especially if it doesn't last for, for months and years, would be a respiratory tract infection like a cold or a flu. Now hopefully with a cold or a flu the cough should be over in a couple of weeks but you could have some persistent infections where your body can't clear it all the way and even though you're relatively healthy that you still have that irritating cough for, for months. I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't take any of this very seriously but I do want to get away from the idea of being powerless that so often we're told that we hear the stories that someone got a diagnosis, they found them in stage four of pancreatic cancer and they had three to six months to live. Those stories make us feel very powerless. But look at the bigger picture and the things we've talked about that most cancers, you have 15, 20 years to do something, to live a healthy life and balance out your structural, emotional, chemical aspects and get your body into balance and then it's very unlikely that you would ever get that diagnosis. It's not guaranteed, but you're reducing the chances dramatically. Not only does it take a long time, but it requires multiple mutations, a series of mutations to develop into something serious, and your body has multiple defenses. It has a lot of time to work on these foreign cells, on these abnormal cells, if you give your body a chance. And the other thing to keep in mind is that there is no form of cancer that is 100% lethal. There are some that have really, really bad numbers, but there is nothing that's 100%. There is always someone who has had what's called a spontaneous remission. The science doesn't really study these people because they're treated as the exception, as a fluke, as some unexplainable miracle. These are people who had the stage four, they were given three to six months and then they go back a couple of months later and the cancer is gone. So what we want to do 
is we want to study these people with the spontaneous remissions. We don't want to write them off. We want to see what is it that they did, what combination of structural, emotional, and chemical lifestyle factors did they incorporate? What did they do? How did they think? What were the factors that was possible to create this spontaneous remission and defeat that cancer? If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.